So we're looking at form studies today and 14-day challengers. I am going to start with the form studies because they, they move back into the 14-day into the, into the challenge. Uh, geometry is geometry. All right, everyone focus. Make sure you're focusing. No more talk about uh, sales and all that. <clears throat> all right, so what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about a light environment, which is something you are... It's not the light environment, the background color is not changing how you're choosing these values is is really like look at how similar these values are to each other. But look at the difference in background. The light environment here has pretty much said, hey, I'm so bright. Even objects are not allowed. No object is allowed to have a shadow. But look at this wonderful shadow here. It's like this shadow existed outside of the temporal space physics of this entire room like this space right here is a black hole it has no light in it it's just an empty cosmos it's just an empty nothingness that's the only way that something can be that dark in a light environment that is that strong this is because you're not you're making this mistake because you don't think about a light environment as a three-parter light environment consists of the background light I mean the light source the background light source, which is the light source bouncing on the background walls, and then the object's value. All those three things affect what kind of values you use on the object. The object here in its midtones and its highlights, it's pretty bright. And it's a pretty mattified object, like it's covered with carpet or some fine microfiber or something. <clears throat> but over here, you just have this sudden drop. How, how is this allowed if you have a, a platform right here beside it reflecting all this light back? This is not permitted. The object has to be this value. The cast shadow is not the same kind of object here. The cast shadow, the, uh, so remember said, I, I said that the object is part of the reason why we, part of the, the object's color, the object's value affects how much light and shadow we use on an object. Well, the object here is naturally a mid gray, light white, I mean light gray, dark white kind of thing. And it's this dark and it's allowed to be this dark because the object is this dark. The pigment, the actual paint on the object is dark. But then you gave me this cast shadow here. This cast shadow, just because it's a cast shadow doesn't mean it takes on the same value as a dark side. This cast shadow doesn't belong to the object, does it? No. This cast shadow isn't attached to the object. It's taking the shape of the object, yeah, because the object is standing in the way of the light and then mirror reflecting its shape on the ground. But the cast shadow belongs to the object receiving it. And this is why we lighten this right here. All right. So you don't have any awareness of your visual of your of your, of your light environment, meaning that you will make this mistake on a face that has a light background, a face that has this skin tone value in a light environment outside cannot possibly get this dark. It doesn't get this dark. There has to be some kind, usually the object is almost always darker than the background anyway, so you'll have a lot of, ch of mid-tones, a lot of meat to add to the painting that'll make it pop out, but you will not get a value that is that dark. That is impossible. Maybe in a pocket, maybe in a dark spot, maybe in a cavity, maybe in some kind of fabric folding that is folded so tightly the light hasn't been allowed to fold in, maybe a black scarf that the character is wearing but in their natural skin tone values, which is why we're studying geometry, so we can transfer it into drawing better bodies and faces, this is this what you had before was wrong. It was way too dark. Cast shadows should be lighter than the darkest of the object if the background is light, if the floor is light, okay? And for this one, same issue. Your bright is this bright. You're telling me the light source. Now the, now the object is lighter than the background. So it means they have some kind of spotlight above them only that is not the universal. There is a big light in the room that is lightening everything up, but it's not a, um, uh, uh, the, the, the universal light source. That's not the main one casting shadows on the object. You said 90 degrees to the top of. That 90 degrees would uh, still means that this depends on what kind of, how, what the size of the light source. This 90 degrees can still be a universal. It doesn't have to be a point light. Um, so if it is a point light, then your cast shadows, if it's this close, your cast shadows will actually move in this direction. Oops. Your cast shadows will move in this direction. If this is the light source right here, you drew the light source right here, right? 
your cast shadows will do this. Remember, it's the, the light source is a vanishing point. Your cast shadows will actually do that. If the backgrounds are this dark, I mean the side walls are this dark and the background is this dark, this has become a spotlight, like an interrogation light or something. If, and take a look at this, let's zoom in. If the light source is so far that the angle of the cast shadow is this high, that means that the light source is so outside of this canvas, it's just like probably 20 canvases away. All right, and then there's, and this this will just keep going. This will probably be like continuously, like probably 20 of these canvases before we get this kind of angle. Compared to this one where the, the light source was here, I chose the center of it and kind of like get that cast shadow I was talking about before. And it's just, it, I mean, you can, you can interpret it as it happen, happening like that, but as long as you have a line here and you have this kind of distance and you said 90 degrees from the middle, this is what you have to do. Determine this distance and then just keep it consistent everywhere. But this is pretty much what we're measuring it on, as if we have this cube right here on this cross part. I'm using my mouse right now because I don't get the perfect lines. Right here, if we were to draw the diagram, this is where that line would be, and that's how you determine this distance, and that's how you keep the cast shadow feeling real. All right, so to ask yourself which kind of, how far is it really? You've already answered the question how far the light source is. If the light source is that far, the cast shadows won't be this sharp. And if they're this sharp, and the background value is this dark, and the light source surface area is this bright, then these guys have no business being this dark because that background was capable of spiking that value all the way up and the shadows here are sharp. As soon as the shadow is sharp, that's how you know you have to uh, lighten all the values because sharp shadow means strong light, right? Sharp cast shadow means high light magnitude. Magnitude just means the strength of the light or the sun or a kind of, of, of like strength the sun has. So write that back to me. A sharp shadow means a strong light source. So let me see if I can select this. No. <clears throat> um, this is probably not going to work, but hopefully. It does. I'm trying to select your uh, your little cast shadows here. And so because this cast shadow was so bright, and because your background was that bright but not super dark, it means you were using a very strong, immediate spotlight that is really, really exposed on this object. So it would look something like this. And one of these surface areas is going to be brighter than the other depending on the bounce light nearby. Um, so because they're equally dispersed, that's why you gave them the same value. But because we might be looking at the mirror, so the specularity of the, of the box, if it's reflective, then the mirror reflection of the floor nearby might cause some kind of effect. But if you're saying it's perfectly high, it's perfectly up, these are all equally displaced from the light, then yes, you did right by making them the same value. But me, what I would do, because I don't want that kind of flatness, this of course is a flattening effect, nobody really films like this, I would bring in a value anyway to represent the floor. This is the specular reflection of the floor. This is the mirror quality on the floor beneath. And so it's not bounced light, it's just a mirror. And I would do the same thing to this side but I wouldn't let the two meet each other like that. So I would give this one a bounce light as well, but on the other side, just to show the mirror reflection. And this is, this is what I would call breaking the light rule, just so we can have a distinction between the surface and the surface. Again, super white background, and here just giving me these values that are just impossible. The light would never allow these, and the floors is just as bright as the light source, would never allow the color 
to even get this strong and you're giving me a sharp shadow none of your shadows here have distinctions none of them have fuzzy edges or, or they never get blurry the further you get how do you blur it is Dirac what's the best way to blur a shadow in a nice clean way on Photoshop control C control V the shadow filter blur Gaussian blur and blur that bitch all right <laughs> and then we get the eraser and then we get we start erasing radially the closer we get to the object a sharper gets uh, a, sh a shadow gets sharper the closer it gets to the object casting it there's one there's two there's three there's four and it's just getting sharper actually that's not right this whole shadow is wrong but it's okay and I'm just radially doing that to the shadow so it gets nice and sharp the further you get nice and blurry the further you get sorry the shadow has started to blur on top of the cube so I gotta erase that out okay and then this one over here is perfectly straight this is perfectly straight it shouldn't do that it should be doing this because it's foot to foot the foot it's getting is the far foot the one that we don't see so you actually don't get this perfect straight if that was straight it means there's another box sitting beside it if we're getting this kind of angle we would get another angle on the other side <clears throat> this is this corner this is this corner and then the other the other foot we don't see the other corner the other corner is camouflaged in and you can you might see some of the other corner like this but it's just so fuzzy by the time it gets to here it's not really worth it but let's see it anyway I'm gonna use blur you can use blur tool if you're low enough resolution and then what happens to cast shadows they get brighter and fuzzier the further we get this is because the light rays are, are emanating away from each other they 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 move away from each other they branch out because they branch out the shadow gets fuzzier it's like a picture the shadow is a picture that we're seeing and it gets fuzzier the further away the object moves the, the cast shadow moves from the object so what you had before super straight no reason why it should be super straight it wasn't foot to foot foot of the shadow to the foot of the object and it's getting fuzzier this light environment is dark the shadows are dark there's bounce light but the ground is dark that's not how it works so this this wouldn't have bounce light if there wasn't some of this light down here this bounce light happens this kind of bounce light happens maybe over here where the ground is bright enough but that that kind of bounce light does not happen in here so this means that in order to fix this we go to the closest fix the closest possible fix to correct this we don't try to fix this by making it as bright as the shadow the reason why I did this is because the brightness this is too blurred by the way for how bright it is but this is just an example on how to blur it <clears throat> but right over here I would blur this out weaken the shadow with a light and color mode layer uh, brush mode I would weaken the shadow I would fuzz out the shadow so filter oops no no control C filter blur Gaussian blur and then erase away gently until it gets closer to the foot of the object and then merge that down get back into dark and brush mode and just darken this dude because he is way way too bright for this kind of dark room and for these kind of dark sides so why this time I went for a dark room here I matched it to be a light room and that means that the shadow could be a little bit sharper as sharp as we had it before which is fine then you have weird little tangents right here this cast shadow this foot right here is just you just have to measure it it's like right there that's it if this is perfectly straight off this foot then this is perfectly straight off this foot where is what's happening here this means that the it's coming from the side direct side it's not going to branch out like that unless the light source is right here sitting beside the object the closer it gets to the object the more the lines move this way because it's a vanishing point right 
but if it's at a point where it's so far away from the object as to create a perfectly straight line cast by that light, then this dude right here isn't gonna be that gonna be that uh, emanated or, or, or umbrellaed. Do you guys see what I'm saying? Okay, so if you want to ask some questions, feel free to ask them right now. This shape is a little funny though. It's a little long, and I and I don't understand why we even have this um, this straight shadow like that. Shadows just it's such an awkward, deliberate shadow casting that it feels like someone manually made it so that the cast shadow is perfectly straight off the sides, projected perfectly off the sides. And then, of course, as usual, the shadow is not as light as it should be, considering the floor that on which it is landing. It needs to be much brighter. These look like real models in a 3D program, because we've considered calculation, and then the next exception, and the next exception, light environments, those three components of the light environment. Make sure you write at Esarac for your questions. Those three components of a light environment are all exceptions to the rule. They're all a form of exception. They can be an exception. If the background is dark, but it's a super light ca uh, light source that is casting super sharp shadows, it means that no matter how dark the light source, the background is, that light source will, will, will tackle it. So the background becomes an exception to the light source's power, and the light source will weaken because the background is so dark. So imagine a super strong floodlight in a black room. But the floodlight is smaller, of course, than the room. Have you ever seen a floodlight at night? What it does to only, only the things that it's bouncing on. So stadium, floodlights, nighttime. I'm not sure if cameras can even capture this effect. But it doesn't feel like nighttime. You still get cast shadows. But of course, it's pretty light considering what it's falling on. You put an object here, you get many cast shadows. Because these are all essentially tiny little candles, and they're still tiny little midget lights compared to the massive size of the of the, of the air around us in the atmosphere and the hemisphere that on which we are you know what, what we see in the sky it's still not strong enough even a floodlight which is probably one of the strongest lights you'll ever see okay moonlight me being a universal light source barely casts a shadow so strong moonlight shadows i don't know if it'll show me Right here, really strong super moonlight. It's not casting the same kind of shadows we get. I don't know if this is a sun. I don't know if this is edited. I don't even know if this is a moon. I don't know if it's edited. These are all like fake. They might be faked. This is daytime. Ew. Monster. All right, so moonlight. Strong moonlight. So a moon that's fully out, just a natural photo, please show me. Just one normal sh uh, photo of a moon. But look out for it, the cast shadows are all soft. All the cast shadows are soft shadows. They're not as sharp as the kind of shadows we get off the sun. See this cast shadow on this leaf? It's sharp because the sun is causing it. The, str the strength of the light source really changes the behavior of a cast shadow. It's, it's hand in hand, one and one the same. <clears throat> but I don't know if there's an example of what moonlight does. It has sharp shadows compared to um, uh, you know, overcast sunlight, but of course it's nowhere near as sharp as the sun. And because we can get sharp shadows by being close to a, a candle in a dark room, you will eventually get see the weakness of that light source because the shadows are so long and it's only bright where you're closer to it, whereas the sun is so strong we're not even far enough to get only some of the light and get a cold planet. We're in the perfect spot where we can get sharp shadows and get all that brightening and get we're close enough to see that it is a it's so strong it behaves universally. Okay, we're always going to get sharp shadows because we're that close to it. At no point is it a filtered light. Nothing is filtering other than our atmosphere. All right, so I hope that shows us like a good universal example of where we see all of this. But you really, really need to start considering whoever the artist was that did that. You need to start thinking about um, all those three parts of the light environment. They come back to haunt you when you're painting a character like this. They come back to haunt you. So you have this strong sunlight, but it's purpley sunset scene. But you have sharp shadows. 
sunset shadows are so fuzzy the further they get because the sun isn't the, the angles are so fuzzy that of the light rays that they just don't make sense like that and then you've got this white crocodile that feels like it's being flooded by light or alligator or something and then you've got all this all this all these shadows on the mountain saying it is a either low midday or complete sun, sunset this this all comes back to haunt you all of the mistakes here are sourced from an a, misunderstanding of what light environment is and not enough studies like those cubes. So good job on that student for trying them. But you have a couple of essential issues going on. No more theory talk. I'm going to answer some questions and then, and then move on to the 14-day challenges. Um, if you want to ask us a direct question, yes, please. Uh, I might have missed it, but Isabak, why does this sh show on the left, why does the show on the left bottom picture fanning like that? What? Why, do, why is this fanning? Why does the shadow on the bottom left picture fanning like that? But I think it's because they thought it was backlit. This is wrong. This is I haven't corrected all of these. Most of these are wrong. All of these were wrong or had some issue with them. If this is backlit and the light is about over there, I guess they mean like sunset where it's set up in such a way. But you're the top right here this piece was actually way too dark because that's not the piece that's looking at it's not top lit so why should the top be lit up the part that's lit up is the part we don't see but students when they do forms they think there always has to be a light side sometimes we don't have a light side sometimes we're eclipsed sometimes there's a silhouette we're in front of the light we are the shadow so this is wrong the cast shadows need to be softer the further they get and they need to be much longer you also have like a fisheye thing going on here. The shadows need to be like all the way here. And they need to be less fanny. They, look fanny. they need to be less fanned out. Okay? And it's never good to just symmetrically line everything up. It looks weird. It looks off. It looks distorted. Hi, Sippy Cup. <clears throat> I think they meant shadow. Yeah, yeah. Um, might have missed it, but it's back. Why does this show on the... Oh, yeah, right. Sorry, I read about that. Let me see other questions. Um, Isabel, is there a way to estimate how long a cast shadow should be? There are, there is, and that's what computer lighting engines do. That's what Porch's Studio does. But it's you, you're not expected to have computer level accuracy with the length as long as it's generally long. As long as you have um, realized in a sunset scene, the light is on the side, so the light rays are coming from the side, meaning that there is so much that the sh object is denying for such a long amount of time before it gets fuzzy. The object doesn't really end if it's sunset. The shadow doesn't really end because the light source do doesn't end. It just gets weaker. And eventually the light source takes over. Do you think that you cast a shadow if you're standing beside the sun? No, you don't. Because the light rays are so strong and the sun is so huge, you don't cast a shadow anymore. But because you're, uh, you have an object horizon, and this is the horizon drop, and then the sun is going beneath it, you are standing in the way of so many long lights that light rays that the cast shadow can probably stretch this far but we only see this much of the cast shadow the cast shadow stretches for longer but by that time not it's not like light bends back and folds and, and, and illuminates it's just by this time the light rays responsible for causing this cast shadow have have long weakened have long fuzzed out and branched out into others it isn't one ray that causes, it's billions and billions of rays that come together as, as it's just, they just keep traveling in one line. And it's tiny little, little particles of light that travel in just one, one route, one highway. They don't bend unless a black hole is there to bend them. But that's like the extreme of how long a shadow should be. In a cast shadow of a sunset, it's the longest it'll ever be. There's no other cast shadow like it. It's the strongest sun we know, the strongest light we know against the brightest, um, against the, against the, uh, uh, the horizon, and it's going to be the longest shadow, and, and, the, and the longest rays, and the longest appreciation of those rays, which are weak, which is why we get oranges and reds at sunset, because they're weaker light, uh, light colors. <clears throat> at no point are you going to, if you're standing in front of a sun, and you're standing this close, and you're this big compared to the suns, that's massive. 
are you are you going to cast a shadow? There's no ha part of you that's a shadow because the the magnitude is so strong. It, th there's just so much light coming from all kinds of angles, all kinds of explosions. No shadow is even allowed to exist. Imagine living in that kind of environment. You'd have no shadows. Everything would be flooded out. You could barely see. Like a, like you've ever been to a desert. You can barely open your eyes. Okay, um, how can you decide how dark light our values should be? By deciding on the value of the object, what is the color of the object? The color of the object determines how dark it is. How dark it is determines how much light is allowed to bounce back. Black hogs light, white reflects light. And so we are, have you ever worn a, like a red shirt out its outside or a black shirt? It gets hot fast because it doesn't reflect light away. And so you don't have light shades on your shirt that is black. But on a white shirt, you don't have that many shadows either because it reflects everything. On like an orange shirt, you have midtones, and that's pretty much how you decide how light and dark you go. <clears throat> how did you learn how dark values get in different light environments? Brighter it is, the less dark neighborhood you have. If this is how bright the light source is, this is how bright the wall is, and this is how dark the object is, you cannot use shadows from down here. It's neighborhoods. You just decide on the neighborhood and adjust thereafter depending on specularity, the reflectivity of the object. <clears throat> you can use blur, to, blur tool in ro low resolution because it, it blurs more pixels. If you have high res, you don't really see. The blur tool doesn't have like the power to rearrange all the pixels the way a smudge tool does. How do you decide the value of the background? Easy. What time of day is it? What time of day am I painting? How much sun is being affected? What's the weather? What kind of room is it? What kind of paint is in the room? What kind of universal light is in the room? Is it daytime? Uh, even mid-afternoon in a room is still dark because you have closed off and you have one window letting the light in. The inside of a cereal box outside in sunlight is still dark if you close all the sides out. So it just depends on whether or not you're letting light into the room and then that behaves like a time of day. <clears throat> um, so let's see if there's any more questions. There we go. That is a lot of light talk, um, but I feel like we needed that. Let's go into some lighter talk. Let me grab some water. Okay, so we are looking at 14 day challenge challenges now, and I'm trying to help them kind of avoid some of these massive mistakes. <clears throat> so there's many ways I could do this. I'm going to go ahead and try just the easy way. If it doesn't work, we'll do something else. Bloop, 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 bloop. The face was very wide. Very super wide. But I am going to erase away at it and bring back the old features on the new face. So let me show you where you were before. You see that? You, it's like you unwrapped it. It's like Google unwrapping 3D modeling or Maya unwrapping or something like that. That's basically what it looks like. It looks like you ironed out the volume. We'll go back to that cereal box <laughs> example. Imagine you stepped on a cereal box and uh, you know you flattened it out, it has no more volume. That's exactly what happens when you guys do this. All right, that's probably the biggest issue you had. Um, I hope you don't have this for the rest of the days. You need to watch the nose video again because what you have here is you're telling me this outline goes all the way down. No, the nose stops. The nose stops at the, at the nostril wings. All right, the nose's anatomy doesn't exist down here. It's, it's done, now it's face. Down here is face. The nose stops just about here. You know what? I'm going to just lighten instead. Do I like no longer have pen pressure or something? I know you want to do bounce light, but what you're doing here is just throwing off the form, through throwing off the anatomy. Down here under the septum, more shadows. Your nose is is has the same value consistently all around. Just 
just like that. And then the sharp edge needs to be brought back. So right now the nose, you extended the bounce light all the way around the nostril and then you added new anatomy to the nostril, which does not happen. The nostril has a little seam and it just stops right there. Go ahead and touch your noses for me. Does your nostril continue all the way under your nostril hole? No, it only has like the flaily, flaily bits right here. You can have some bumps here. Yeah, maybe a bump or two, but definitely not a bump that works like a bounce light and definitely not exposed as a surface area like bounce light is. So you need to stop with the extensive overuse of bounce light around the nose. It's not going to save the day. If your edges are not good and you don't understand anatomy, bounce light isn't going to save your painting. It isn't going to save your anatomy. It isn't going to save your form. Bounce light is an accessory. It comes after the fact and it is hardly useful in areas that are pockets. It's only useful when you have sides of stuff exposed to partial light or like 50% displaced from the light source. Not something that looks away completely from the light source and is part of a, a dark spot system. So getting this and doing that is it's just gonna flatten your piece. This looks more appropriate. This looks more like a nose. And just as what we just learned on that cube page, this cast shadow is, all right, I'll let you guys answer. Is the cast shadow too light or too dark underneath the nose? <clears throat> just gonna go over here check my twitter <laughs> while you guys are answering bounce light is secondary light yeah it can behave as secondary light anything that is not directly coming out of the primary's belly is a secondary light it can be secondary as bounce secondary as pinpoint it's too dark too dark let's see what everybody else says too dark Looks like the girl got a cold. Dark, 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 dark. I hope you guys aren't saying too dark because that's the answer I hinted at before, but it's too dark. And a lot of you are saying this because it feels too dark. It feels like a mustache. Um, and you guys have this visual instinct to know when something looks too dark or feels too dark. Um, <laughs> someone say too light to be the odd one out. <laughs> um, yeah, it's too dark. So I'm just going to Sorry, my voice is failing me. Uh, it's been a very stressful day. But, yeah, that's too dark. I'm lightening that up. Look at how pale she is. Look where her values are. This is very pale. This is extremely pale. And then I'm going to go into liquify and adjust some more bone structure stuff. The forehead is fine. I've seen some pretty cubed foreheads come out of girls, but the, the jawline is a little bit too um, masculine. So I would just try to soften the jaw. Even if she does have amazing bone structure, I don't want it to look like an effeminate man. I want it to look like a uh, a woman that has a bit a bit more than the average, but definitely not masculine jawline structure. 14 day challenge is supposed to be uh, painted without androgyny. Um, so just uh, take a take take a break from those social trends and just focus on anatomy for, for, for a second. There is female anatomy and scientifically documented differences between male and female and 14 day challenge is excellent to teach yourself the difference between male and female so you can design male and female when you need to so i'll show you before that and then i'll show you the complete before and you'll see the differences see what happened to the nose And look at the face. Very masculine, right? But very unwrapped. Like someone unwrapped her ears and then that because then zipped the back of her like cranial skin area and then just opened them out, fanned them out to, to air them out a little bit. <clears throat> Do you see what you did with the nose? You brought down that anatomy, you drooped it down so low. The nose actually just ended way earlier than that. I hope these are all, you know, nice and checked off in your 14-day challenge before day six. You cannot move into day six without correcting these and making sure these are visible in day six. You typically, with my students, I require that they correct and then start the new day. 
That way you have twice over you've attempted and to apply the newfound knowledge, not just one time. It's very dangerous and very possible that you recede into old habits. Another thing I want to show you is right here, the lips are completely flat. You have one of the core shadows for the lip, but you don't have them both. Because the upper lip is a pigmentation, so it comes naturally dark, I can only do this for so long. But it's a cylinder on a cylinder. So now the lip has a bit more volume. The lower half of the second cylinder has more volume. You have almost no radial shading anywhere on the painting. That's bad. If you watch any of my, like, the last 10 classes I've uploaded on YouTube, they all have some kind of discussion on radial shading. And if you don't know what radial shading is yet, you're not, I, I disown you. <laughs> I've talked about it for like a solid year already. All right, so this radial shading right here is needed for this because the lip slowly starts descending. It doesn't just suddenly come on because it's not a sticker. So before, after, before, after. Very unusual anatomy. Beautiful job on the eyes. Very unusual anatomy around the nose. Um, and the head. What you need to do now is bring in some dark spots. Dark spots are on the lash line. Even when you're a little blonde, your lashes tend to be a little bit darker. If you're albino or ginger, it's very different. Or you have ginger qualities or you're half ginger. I don't know what, how it works. Your lashes tend to be a little lighter. Uh, but again, that's an exception. That's a unique customization to the rules. Just learn the general. Learn the average. Average is brown eyes. Average is brown hair and just learn that and then you can step up out of that okay but I'm just trying to make everyone draw brown eyed brown haired people because I'm brown -eyed. <laughs> it's the superior combination <laughs> um, okay so for this piece it's just, it's just it's just so so out there it's just so creative so much creativity which is good, I guess, but you're, you're not supposed to be stressing your creative muscles or even flexing them for the 14-day challenge. But we've got value sharing. Nose anatomy looks great. Face looks a little bit off. Position of the eyebrows is very unusual. Eyebrows are overly textured. Trust me, I experienced this last night with my study on stream. I over-textured the eyebrows, but at the end, I discovered it. I discovered it was too textured and I just under textured the eyebrows. Please don't over texture the eyebrows. It's just gonna look like caterpillars and it's gonna look really funny. Or centipedes, those are more disgusting. Caterpillars are cute in some ways, as long as they don't touch me. <laughs> and then we've got the no arc on the eyebrows. The eyebrows are so overstated. The eyes are slanted too much. They're anatomically off the, the head is not a head that feels like it went through puberty at all. It feels like a very babyish, um, kind of like young boy, prepubescent head. I have no low jaw. I have a very over-rounded face. The thickness of the neck is too thick. It doesn't feel like a mature woman. Mature faces just get longer. You want to show the difference between 15 years old and 27 years old? Just a long face. Tucking this in. Just getting rid of that worried eye. Way too worried, man. The nose is too small. It needs to be wider. I'm going to take care of the eyes in a second. Actually, I'll just do that right now. Lifting this back up. You had too much of a slant. And rounding the eyes back, tucking this corner in. She still has pretty eyes. Easy. Take it easy. I know you're start starting to hyperventilate. No, my beautiful stylistic eyes. But you have no business stylizing any kind of anatomy in a 14-day challenge. You wanted, to, you wanted to call yourself a 14-day challenger, right? These are the requirements of it. No over-exaggeration of weird features. Learn the, fund, learn the fundamentals and the anatomies first. And then... If you can sneak in slight, not over-exaggerated stylizations, you, you're allowed, but ideally it's not recommended because you're, start, you're trying to find the, what you're capable of, what is hireable. You're trying to perfect all of that. So now that I lengthen the face, I'm going to tuck in her cheekbones to give her some cheekbones. She still looks extremely shocked. So you just don't want that as your default expression, the only one you can draw. 
look at this value sharing. She basically has discoloration or some kind of skin disease on either side of her nose because it's the only equivalent of this in real life. There's nothing like this in real life other than a, a, a deformity. The distance between the nose and the mouth was way too close. There was no distance, and that made it look like a baby. Again, prepubescent. So what I'm going to do is extend the distance between the nose and the mouth. And then it's starting to look a little bit more universal, but the jawline is still too strong. So I'm going to tuck it in to get that triangular finish that is a female face. Tuck in the, the, the chin with these little concave meeting, like the concave line in between the, the jaw and the chin. And then tuck in the temples to be a little bit more square to get rid of that circular silhouette. This is as much as I can do in the time allowed. I have to close up shop in a second. Do you have any questions for any of the changes I just made, guys? Remember, at me so that I could see the question. All right. So you've got value sharing almost everywhere. It feels like the face was blown up like a balloon, and you drew the face on a balloon, and then you blew up the balloon. It didn't feel like accurate anatomy. It felt like there's some kind of distortion in your memory right now. You're distorting. So value sharing, where does that happen? Probably like everywhere where it's not supposed to be. Uh, shadow, there's a shadow. So the sides of the nose have no business being dark because they look up at the light. <clears throat> up here in her in her in her upper upper lip, yeah, it can be a little dark there because of, of some pigmentation in hair, but not that dark. And definitely not on the ideal we're attempting. Dark is good around here. I'm gonna go ahead and just make the eye, eyes a little bit more eyebrows a little bit more neutral. The sides of the head are dark, but they're not as dark as the coarse shadow. So again, sorry about my voice guys, I'm starting to sound <laughs> really bad. Carrying that up here, the cheekbone up. And then this beard shadow is great, but it has exceptions. Upper lip is an exception. Sorry about the soft brush, I gotta hurry up. And you have no radial values. All this, all this, you know, funky stuff, all this creativity, and no radial values? What's the point anymore then? And then now I see it as, you know, this is why I, I undermine your creativity, is because they stand in the way of you actually using fundamentals. You hide your lack of fundamentals with creativity. To hell with your creativity if it's standing in the way of you getting better. I said that to myself. And now every time if someone asks me, why aren't you doing masterpieces? I say, to hell with the masterpieces. Every time I do a study and I think I did well, I look back at it and it looks like ass. And I say, you know what? Fuck this. I don't want to draw a hand. I don't want to draw, I mean, I don't want to draw uh, uh, clothing. I don't want to decide on a background. I don't want to fuck the narrative for a second. Let me go jump in straight into the next face I want to draw, into the next anatom anatomical study I want to draw, because I don't want to delay between me and my next lesson that I learn. To hell with creativity if it makes you make these kinds of mistakes and draw these distorted, um, non-human things. You want to get better, right? You want to get that notoriety? You want to get better? That's the only way. You just, just say, uh, screw your creativity to the sticking place. All right, and then the neck, I mean, the, the, the bridge of the nose and the forehead do connect, but through this glabella shadow. That's when I realized, Isterak, you may be teaching people, you may be uh, getting a bit more professional with your portraiture, but you got a lot left to learn. And the more masterpieces you do, the more weeks you waste on six hours a day of rendering on another stupid story, the more you're going to waste, the more time you're going to waste. You could be doing another face and perfecting that. And for me, my journey is portraiture. I want to be a specialist in, in portraits. That's my specific journey. I want to be, I want to be good at uh, drawing bodies too, but the portrait I feel is the real character, as in the portrait. Of course, there's characterization with gesture and body type, but not in the variety we get with, with portraits. So if your creativity is getting in the way of you getting better, then say no. Say no to your creativity. 
for a second. Just, just that ego that's forcing you to make things look a little bit more fantastical and elvish. And I, I know we all have that part of us that wants to create things we've never seen before and see, see, see areas we've never seen before. But this is going to get you more than this. You have less of an audience for this. The eyebrows are unusual. The eyes are far apart. You've over slanted the eyes. I promise you, if you actually rendered real anime anatomy, it you would you would you wouldn't sleep at night. That thing would haunt you for the rest of your life. You don't ever transfer anime anatomy in any kind of way. <clears throat> and every time I critique this, yeah, I've been teaching the same lesson, but the difference between each video is the the variety of the mistakes that, that students make. The variety of the ways this mistake is manifested, student to student. But it's always been the same answer. It's like you drew a picture on a balloon and then you blew the balloon up. I want to see um, musculature. I want to see bone structure. And if you feel like this face is too long for your taste, you have a matured taste, now you want to try it, that's fine. Decrease the distance between the nose and the mouth. You want a matured girl, but she also looks a little bit cherubish. You can do this. You can get. You can do. You can do the opposite of this. You don't have to lengthen the nose. You can keep the nose as is, right where it was before. Or you can lengthen it. Oh, sorry, not where it was before. Higher than where it was before. If you want the face to feel a little bit less masculine, even though some masculine is wonderful on a female face, absolutely wonderful, you can go ahead and get rid of that deep jaw. Keeping um, the most of your, of your uh, characteristics from before. So it isn't necessarily changing too much. I like the longer face, it feels a little bit more mature especially if you're going for that much beauty, that much makeup. But in your 14-day challenge, please don't over-characterize, over-stylize, over-render uh, your expressions. It does not look good. It looks tacky and immature and cheesy. You want to remove all and any of your bad tastes out of the way because you want to only be left with your skill. And you're going to use those bad tastes and that massive amount of... Uh, opinion you have of your creativity to hide mistakes and you're not going to learn. <clears throat> Let's see some questions. Um, do you have any tips for portrait gestures? Um, there's not much, it's a closed gesture. A closed gesture is an unmoving gesture. You never do a moving gesture for a zoom up. It has to be some kind of closed stillness to it. Um, it's not an explosive gesture. Explosive gestures are, you got to zoom out to appreciate those and stage them like that. So when someone is sitting down and they're moving their hands around or they're dancing, you just have to look at sitting, dancing, or a, find some kind of a gesture that you can do while sitting down, like holding a fan and, or, or, or using a magnifying glass or studying or looking at a book. Those are all active gestures. But you have to remember that a portrait is zoomed up for a reason. That's for the face. It's not about the body. I think I just got symbolic. It's okay. Get symbolic. But symbolic is also creative. Symbolic is also a dependency of the past. <clears throat> Teach getting savage. <laughs> I'm not getting savage. <laughs> Hamlet? No, that's Macbeth's wife. Screw your courage to the sticking place. <clears throat> it's Lady Macbeth. Is the nose too high up on the first 14-day challenge? Um, I'm not looking back at that. Uh, uh, I'm going to have to look back at that, aren't I? No, it's fine. How do you feel about flipping the initial sketch of the first eye to get the other eye? That's fine. That's perfectly fine. Um, when you guys are using those kinds of enhancements, you're still good susceptible to making a mistake. It doesn't mean you're not going to make the mistake. What I do, I don't personally do that. Um, because I don't do that, and because I flip the canvas, I've been getting better that I don't even need to flip the canvas anymore. But I've never, unless I really want to make sure, for sure I'm going to get the right eye, I've never flipped the canvas just so I can get the right eye. I always end up flip, flipping it back anyway. And if you stay in one flip too long, you're going to go back into your distortions. So it's not just about flipping to get the other eye, it's about constantly flipping between any of the features. 
Um, if you feel like the way your hand leans is just not going to work out on the other side, try it anyway. Try to figure out how you, how you feel about gesture lines in the opposite direction, moving your brush in the opposite direction um, but without needing to flip. But it's perfectly fine to flip. There is no prejudice. There is no... Um, uh, oh, you're not a artist if you flip. You're not an artist if you use digital. That all comes from that really dangerous, almost religiously um, uh, Puritan traditional worship, and that's all just crap. If they really want to uh, talk about using materials and just don't use paper then because that's manufactured and you're cheating, you might as well make your own paper. It's just very, very hypocritical to think like there's restrictions that make you either an artist or not. A tool is a fucking tool. If there was a way we could dig a grave faster, we would have found that way and we'd use it proudly, all right? Okay? And we did. We found ways to dig graves faster. <laughs> and we used them to dig any kind of hole in the ground. There's no shame in using a bulldozer, is there? There's no shame in flipping your canvas. I struggled so bad with this one. Uh, it wasn't style. I just fucked up. No, you didn't fuck up. You have. Uh, I didn't have to correct that much to get the eyes back into place. I just had to square them back like the, like the glabella wasn't blowing up. Like the middle wasn't bl blowing up. Don't say you fucked up. Every, one mistake out of the way now. <clears throat> Top Google search for radial shading is this Dirac's video. Awesome. I didn't know that. Okay, so let's see if there are any more questions. Um, you're very welcome, Titan. This is unrelated, but do you remember your first paid job and how did it work out for you? Um, <laughs> it is very, very unrelated, so I'm just not going to answer it. It was, it was, it was fun. It was fun. It was, it was a step in the right direction. I didn't know much, but the artist thought I was good, and that was all that mattered. I did the art for them, and they, I guess they were satisfied. I actually feel like I'm not getting better because I spend time on sketching and studying rather than rendering since I can't perfect my drawings due to lack of rendering experience. <clears throat> Honestly, it's the same thing as when someone says, I can't drive because I don't have driving experience, so I am I guess I'm just never going to drive, so I'm just going to keep perfecting using my bus routes. You're not going to learn how to drive if you don't get behind a wheel. You're not going to ever suddenly wake up with wheel-like with, with, with wheel experience. Who's gonna, who's, who signed on to your account and got you wheel experience while you were sleeping? Nobody. It's, it doesn't work like that. If you're gonna be, if you're gonna, if you know this, then bite the bullet, tighten your belt, and just jump in and just start rendering and draw and render the worst piece of shit blob of bad values you can come out with. Get as many ugly blobs out of the way as possible make the mistakes that's the only way you're going to get past that is you just take it like a champ and just suck just please suck let yourself suck um and that way you can actually start building up real experience you know how to blend you know how to move your brush around you know what brush you like you understand your hand weight um just just do it that's <laughs> that's what they mean by just do it just start it close your eyes and just start that's what she said. <clears throat> yes, Ashanti, Emily, just join the community, read the rules, and start posting. Yeah, so if you guys, I'm not going to do any more because my voice is gone. But um, let me just get the community link. So if you guys like what you see, you want to join the community, you just have to go here. This is where I chose this piece from. Go to istabrak.com, click on the little Google Plus icon, join it. And that's where you can post your work, look at the assignments, the coming challenges. We have a quite a massive challenge for Halloween this year. Please join it. Have some fun. Show us what you can do. Read, read through it. It is a challenge that uh, invites you to try the crazy. It will be, it will be um, critiqued on your creativity and just whimsical whimsy. It's not going to be critiqued on whether or not it's a believable functional character. If for some reason it's a witch that has a house on top of a broom, and that house is a nuclear power plant that, I don't know, it could be anything. But as long as it's fun and you have fun with it, it's a way to flex your randomization muscles and your creativity. So this is a challenge that is allowing you to explore your creativity completely, utterly. Um, so that's, that's something for you guys to try. Um, make sure you upload to the right category. And make sure you're not, make sure you're following the rules. You're not posting fan art. I don't approve of any fan art that is not followed by either a realistic light source or 
um, is uh, like a, a realistic version of that character. So if you're drawing pixel for pixel some some stupid Overwatch character in the exact color and style they were designed in originally, that's going to get denied. If you're trying a more realistic ap approach to an Overwatch character, but I'm completely not allowing Overwatch at all, but as an example, that might be allowed if it's like a if it's like a Lord of the Rings character or something like that, where you had to put in some kind of creative energy into making it. If you're just going to redraw someone else's drawing, that's not art and that's not going to, that's not going to help you improve. I will let you guys go. See you guys later. See you guys on Tuesday, um, next week on the 26th. Bye.